So tell me, why is Cetra using, I'll call this old, old world technology, just because it looks old. <laughs> why, why are you guys, after 30 plus years, still building your differential pressure sensor, your pressure sensor with this technology? It, it seems to me that everybody else is going to a technology that has this chip on it. Tell me what, to, why are you guys sticking here? Good question. Well, first thing is, yeah, my daddy always told me, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. This technology was developed by Cetra back in the late 1960s. Well, that's, that's why I'm asking the question. You, um, it seems to me that Cetra's been basically a pr pressure company for your entire existence until recently you guys have moved into temperature, humidity, and current sensors. Right. Um, but by and large, you're probably still right. way more... Uh, Pressure is Pressure's what Cetra has been doing forever. Right. This is what we design, this is what we make, this is what we invested our time in, this is what invested our company into, was this sensing technology and this, this sensor, whereas the companies that are using these sensors, the manufacturers of these sensors are not the manufacturers that you're buying them from. Right. The manufacturers you're buying these from are not pressure companies. They are HVAC control companies that may have started out making temperature controls in the beginning, they may have started out being a, a, a current switch company, they may have been starting out being a, a humidity transmitter company. But now they've, you know, like a lot of companies, are putting more products into their basket and being yeah. uh, the, 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 the provider of all to, no, to any contract. Is this manufactured in the U.S.? This, this Absolutely. Sensor? Everything on that is made in the U.S. And the rest of the sensor, the, the component that sits Absolutely. In? Everything that's made on that is made in the United States. Do you States. know if these are manufactured in the U.S.? The dies on those, uh, the die, when I say die, I'm talking about the structure, the actual sensor that the wafers come from. Um, if they're not made in California, they're made in China. I mean, you know, the fabs are either in California or China. That particular the one that we have in our hand right there is made in China. The, um, the structure behind the capacitive sensor um, is that everything that's used on it is made of the same materials, all 17.4 pH stainless steel. The housing, the um, fixed electrode, and then the diaphragm that's sandwiched in between the two clamshells, it's all 17.4 pH stainless steel. So there's a piece of stainless steel. Piece of stainless steel will thin. go over that, depending on the pressure range, will determine the thickness of that stainless steel. But that thing, stainless steel is laid over the top of that, and then the cap Clamps, is put on. Curves it. And then it's put on the top. The top is put on, and then they are welded. So you've got this three piece structure now. You've got a bottom cap that has the fixed electrode. You have this piece of stainless steel, very thin in the middle, that's sandwiched in between, and then a cap on top okay that is welded radial welded around the edges um, and at that point <clears throat> you've got a, a capacitive sensor but the one unique thing that Cetra does at that the next step is they take that clamshell they put it inside of a press and they punch it to basically flatten it out a little bit and it basically creates the uh, diaphragm radial positioning of the diaphragm to be pushed out just a little stretches bit. It, it stretches it like a, like a drum. Mm -hmm. um, that radial tension does wonders for uh, the sensitivity of the device, of the sensor. What's this? That is a, uh, this is a MEM structure that's used in a lot of um, low pressure and high pressure sensors that are made today that utilize a piezo-resistive technology um, That's a little piece of glass, I see. There's a piece of glass, exactly. And what they've done is they've taken a piece of glass, very small piece of glass, and etched a diaphragm into it. You're creating a strain gauge so that when that diaphragm bends in one direction or the other, the resistance will change, and you measure that resistance and compute that back into a pressure. Okay, Here, here's my problem as a layperson. This looks substantial, expensive, and old, layperson. And this looks high tech, modern, and technically cool. Why do I want this over this or vice versa? Well, again, is that this sensor, in the mode that it's in, with a <clears throat> with electronic circuit that's measuring capacitance. Now, these these devices are capacitors. They're t completely different than a strain gauge. A capacitor 
does not require an additional element to sense the pressure change. We are using the, the diaphragm material as nothing more than a barrier to capture air on one side or the other, and whichever side is higher is gonna force that barrier to move. When that barrier, which is the diaphragm, moves, we're measuring the capacitance change between this fixed part and that diaphragm that's moving. Um, for low pressure, you get an unbelievable amount of output out of those sensors. Um, raw signal anywhere between two and four volts. That allows us to, to minimal, minimal uh, amplification to bring that up to a usable signal, which is generally looked at as being 10 volts. If you, you want to get up to 10 volts for the resolution for so your sensor. So a couple times amplification. You're right, you're only doing it a couple of times. What is this? These piezo-resistive sensors, MEM structures, um, strain gauges, typically give an uh, output change of one to two millivolts. So we're talking 2,000 to 4,000 millivolts versus one to two millivolts. So Big it's a difference. difference of thousands. Thousands, yes. So the more we amplify, the more we amplify any impurities or noise or, or fuzzy exactly. stuff as well as the, the actual pure signal we're trying to, to, to read. Exactly. With this device, the signal that you're generating, that two to four volts, you're only amplifying it one, two, three times max, okay? Um, which means that if there's any noise or any other variables that are in there that are undesirable, you're not amplifying the bad stuff, which then requires you to filter mm -hmm. or compensate for. So less handling of the signal means a better, stronger signal, more reliable signal. These devices, um, when you're amplifying a low millivolt signal 3,000 times, 4,000 times to get up to a 10 volt threshold, um, you're also amplifying every little bit of noise, every little bit of uh, instability that's in that device. The main, the, the bulk of the sensors that we sell that are yours are, are single range sensors, I right. think. Um, but your competition that, that I'm aware of all sell multi-range, multi-output sensors. What's the compromise there? Right. Well, is there is there one? Well, it, there is. Let, let me just give you a little bit of background on, on the sensor that, that Cetra has been making for, you know, almost 40 years now. Um, these sensors, um, we make ranges as low as a 20th of an inch all the way up to 100, 150 inches. The ranges that are most widely used are 10th inch, quarter inch, one inch, two and a half inch, three inch, five inch. The electronics that are used, um, the repeatability of the electronics is very important because they use the same electronics package looking for the same basic change in capacitance on each sensor no matter what the range is. So if I'm looking at X picofarads of, of pressure change for my resolution for the for whatever range, it's gonna be the same whether it's a 20th of an inch, one inch, or 10 inches. Mm -hmm. The difference comes in the diaphragm. My diaphragm will either be a little thicker or maybe a little bit smaller. And you change these. So the signal to noise ratio is the same. It's gonna be the same because I'm looking at the same amount of capacitance change. So there's consistency in our circuitry, okay? And there's consistency in our basic construction and development of this and produ production of this of this sensor. Getting back to your original question, these products, these, these sensors, the piezo-resistive sensors, um, up until probably the last 10 years, the lowest range, they didn't get down very low. 10 inches, you know, was about as low as you can make a sensor. Um, improvements in, in, uh, in yields, in, in manufacturing, in the fabs, you know, for the, uh, to make the silicon wafers, have allowed them now to even make lower range sensors. So they can make a one inch sensor. They can make, I don't know if they go much lower than that, maybe they make a half inch sensor. Um, but one inch is well within their range now. They decided to uh, take their sensors, their 10 inch sensors and their one inch sensors, and make them cover multiple ranges. They would take a 10 inch sensor and make it go down to one inch so that you could select 
I can make this a one inch unit, a five well, how do you inch do unit. Just, just amplify Well, what they would do the is they, they, they would put a 10 inch sensor because they have to have at least the highest range in there because you can't over range right, it. Right. Um, and they would derate those sensors. They would take a 10 inch sensor and for a one inch range, this is kind of obvious, they'd be using one tenth, one -tenth of the range. So they're taking the signal at the one, one zero to one tenth of an inch and taking that little bit of signal that's, the, the whole sensor is given out this much. Well, the whole thing is given a couple of millivolts, right. and now they're going to take that and factor it down and, by and a 10. And then divide that by however many degrees you need, not degrees, uh, increments you need right. to measure 0.01 to 0.1. Exactly. And what it did is it, it took all those, you know, a 10-inch sensor that comes out today and used as a 10-inch sensor, and is a 1% sensor or a 2% sensor, they're, they're gonna meet that spec, they're gonna be good. If you buy a one, one inch sensor, it's gonna be in that 1%, 2% range, it's gonna work. But when you take a 10 inch sensor, and now you wanna make it work down in the lowest 10% of its range, and only use the zero to one inch range out of it, or flexibility in it, you take all those additional errors that we had to take and magnify, and you magnify them even more because you're only using just a small bit of that output and you've got to really turn up the gain to get the desired so output that you want. So the whole range of 0 to 10 inches you were two to 3,000 amplifications to get there and now you're only going to read a tenth of those. Exactly. I, I get the point. You know yeah. once the the competitors came out with those products and they started to get a foothold because it was easy for somebody to take a one inch or a 10 inch sensor and not have to worry did I size it wrong, did I buy the wrong sensor, do I need a two inch here, do I need a five inch um, well, all they had to do was take it to the job and put a couple of dip switches and they had the right range. At least that's what they thought they were getting. Um, you know, they install the device, they set the dip switches, turn everything on, and then they got the magic auto zero button that they get to push because there's a display on this device. And they hit the magic auto zero button and they're reading zero now. And that guy says, wow, good, it's working, it's done, and he walks away. The untold truth now is that they've got a sensor that's in an application that they're using half or a quarter of the range that is extremely temperature sensitive, especially down in the lower end, that's being magnified 5,000 times, times whatever the, you know, if we're only using a quarter of that, that ends up being 20,000 times. Yeah, I mean, it yeah. gets, it, it, the numbers become really astronomical. And you're relying on this thing to continue to repeat and, and work the same way year after year after year because how often does somebody go back up on that duck and check yeah. that device you know mm -hmm. but realistically if what you're looking for is long-term stability a repeatable sensor that's going to continue to operate in the method that it was originally designed for and what the building was designed for your best bets to buy the range you know if you've got a duck static measurement that needs to be you know one and a half inches you buy a two inch device mm -hmm. you know long term you know, it's another spec that's on these on these transducers, on these sensors, is a long-term stability spec. Um, Cetras, all of these sensors, the the, uh, the tension diaphragms, once they're put into a package, calibrated, uh, our stability spec is a half percent a year. Um, but that's the spec. We're stating that it's not going to change more than a half percent a year. These products, their spec is two percent a year. Now, I will tell you that there's a lot less to go wrong and all 17.4 pH stainless, then when you start looking at multi, you know, component yeah. MEM structures like this. Now this looks delicate, yeah. The biggest thing that, that attacks these types of sensors is temperature change. You know, if they're, if they're <clears throat> operating a strain gauge, uh, by virtue of its properties, it's a thermometer. I mean, it will, you can lay it on the, you can hook up a strain gauge and not do anything, no, do not move it and change the temperature in the room and see the resistance change on it. You can't do that with this. It's not going to change this, especially since it's all 17.4 pH stainless. When it, when the temperature changes and this thing wants to expand, it's all the same material. It's all going to expand at the same rate. Mm -hmm. So there's not going to be any, any change at all. It all negates everything. This type, this type of technology, you've got multi-layers of different components, different materials that all change when temperature changes, and they're all pulling on each other. And when you've got a strain gauge as the method of measuring that strain, you're measuring temperature change or pressure. You don't know. Yeah. So. Well, I appreciate you clearing this up because uh, I've been wondering for a long time what the difference between these are. <laughs> now I understand. 
Appreciate that. Thank you.